All right. Today we'll be talking about Leber congenital amaurosis. Leber is the person who discovered the disease. Congenital refers to the fact that this disease is present from birth. And then amaurosis refers to a Greek word that means dim, uh, which is a reflection of the loss of sight that is seen in this disease. So the clinical characteristics of LCA, as it's abbreviated, um, include progressive vision loss in infancy and early childhood. Patients, particularly infants, will present with nystagmus. So this is a um, beating of the eye movements. And they'll also present with the oculodigital sign. And so what that is, is when you see an infant who presses or rubs on their eye, and the reason they're doing this is to stimulate their visual pathways. Now, if you or I were to try to rub our eye, we would actually have the sensation of light, uh, which is what the infants also sense. So this is the, the reasoning why the infants uh, tend to do this. One characteristic of LCA is that the organ systems outside of the eye to, are unaffected. So if you have a patient who has multisystemic involvement that includes uh, retinal degeneration and say hearing loss or liver involvement, um, that's not going to be LCA, especially on an exam. And also keep in mind that the development, cognitive development of patients is normal in LCA. LCA is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner in almost all cases. It's caused by loss of function variants in over 20 genes that are involved in the function of the retina. And this is an example of locus heterogeneity, meaning that multiple genes can cause the same phenotype. On the right here, we're looking at a schematic of the eye. So the light enters from the left side here through the cornea, um, and then goes through the front part of the eye and hits the back part of the eye, which is where you have the retina. And the retina is where phototransduction occurs, meaning where light is converted into chemical signals that are sent to the brain. And the retina is that specialized membrane that does that for us. And you can see the different layers of the retina here. And in particular, the photoreceptor cells. So those are your rods and cones. And then right next to that, you have the retinal pigmented epithelium or the RPE that supports those photoreceptor cells. The diagnosis of LCA is made on molecular testing. Now, just of note, at least as of 2023, there's pharma-sponsored molecular testing that's available at no charge to patients for retinal disorders whenever a retinal disorder is suspected. Now, electroretinograms will show severely decreased or absent electrical activity in these patients. And then a fundoscopic exam will show retinitis pigmentosa. Now, the term here is important to um, to mention, so retinitis referring to the retina, and then pigmentosa referring to pigment or color changes. So we'll see an example of that now. On the left, we have a fundoscopic image. So basically, we're looking at the back of the eye um, in a patient who's had probably a dilated eye exam, and you see the normal um, fundus, which is the retina. You see the vessels without any pigmentary changes. And then on the right, we have a patient who has retinitis pigmentosa, and you can see these dark areas of pigment that are forming um, on the fundus. And this is an example of retinitis pigmentosa where you have these pigmentary changes um, in the back of the eye. And this is a schematic of how I like to think about retinitis pigmentosa, a little bit simplified, but I think it does help, uh, particularly for exams, so when you think about retinitis pigmentosa, I want you to think about first non-syndromic versus syndromic causes of RP. So non-syndromic causes, again, like LCA, 
do not have any involvement outside of the retina or the eye itself. Compare that, you know, contrast that with the syndromic causes, which do have multiple organ involvement outside of the eye. So one example of those of a syndromic cause of retinitis pigmentosa are the ciliopathies. These include Usher syndrome, which can also present with hearing loss and balance issues, as well as bardet beetle syndrome, for example. Now back to the non-syndromic causes, there can be different modes of inheritance for non-syndromic RP, with autosomal recessive being the most common. And of those, there can be both adult and pediatric onset RP that is autosomal recessive. And when you have pediatric onset autosomal recessive RP, you really want to think about labor congenital amaurosis. There's about 20 or so genes, as was mentioned, that can cause LCA. Among those is one called RPE65. That's an important one to remember because there's a therapeutic for that particular um, genetic variant, whereas there is no therapeutic, unfortunately, for the other causes of LCA. Okay, so in terms of management and prognosis, patients will have progressive vision loss. So unfortunately, in most cases, there's nothing we can do about it um, in terms of restoring vision. However, we can help patients adapt to their low vision um, environment. And so through that, that includes low vision rehabilitation. Many patients with, R with um, LCA also have myopia, so they are nearsighted and require lenses. So this is something that can be prescribed even from infancy, as you see on the right here. Now, as I mentioned for RPE65 related LCA, patients can have a um, gene therapy that can be delivered. It's called Luxterna. And this has been shown to slow and in some cases even reverse the disease course, which is really quite remarkable. Um, this was the first gene therapy that was approved by the FDA for a monogenic indication. So really a breakthrough treatment, and it has paved the way for a number of other gene therapies that are currently in development. If you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. You can subscribe to my weekly newsletter with board-style questions for genetics exams. And you can also buy me a coffee to show your support for the channel. Thank you.